Israel considers itself to be the only country in the world that is surrounded by its enemies from all over its sides, from the north, from the south, from the east, from the west. This is how they consider themselves. And they said that if we lose one war, one war, that will be the end of us. Let's take a look at this video and I'll be making a few comments about how Israel became militarily so high tech. Let's take a listen. To be small does not necessarily mean to be insignificant or incapable. Israel stands as proof of that thesis. Since its inception, the country has produced a batch of impressive weapons ranging from drones, tanks, missiles to satellites and cybersecurity. Yes, Israel has done well for itself in terms of creating an indigenous aerospace and defense industry. But how did this come to be? How did a small nation of 8 million become a high-tech military superpower? Israel is a major player in the global arms market is hardly news. Those who disapprove of the country find it a source of resentment, while those who approve of Israel find it a source of empowerment. But whatever the geopolitical preferences are, to understand the Israeli arms industry is to understand the state of Israel. When the country came into existence, its military existed of a band of ragtag militias who barely had the means to manufacture ammunition for their firearms. The government had to import weapons from established defense industries, which was oftentimes done covertly and illegally. That One thing I want to mention to you is that before Israel was created, the Yahudi, the Jew, they came from all over the world. Some came from France, some came from Britain, some came from Argentina, from the Soviet Union, Russia, uh, from many other places. So they did not really know how to build a weapon, you know, how to make weapon. Uh, forget about fighting, they did not even know the basics. So when they came to Israel, slowly but surely over time they have developed. So if you take a look at the pace, at the speed they have developed all these technologies, it's just unbelievable. Our arrangement worked well enough in the early years of state building. But in the 1970s, things took a huge turn. Israel had made a severe geopolitical miscalculation. You see, up until then, France had been the primary weapon supplier of Israel, but for political considerations, the French decided otherwise and cut Israel off. No more fancy warplanes and tanks. At the same time, the Soviets began pouring massive quantities of sophisticated weapons into the Arab states. Soon after... Okay, so uh, during that time, I want to also let you know, during that time when Israel was cut off by France and Britain and Germany from supplying any kind of modern uh, technology weapon fighter jets, that was the time when Iran, on the other hand, was going through some radical changes. The Shah came to power in the year 1978-79, Obviously, they could not stay in power, but after Shah was gone, the government, the Shah government, the Shah dynasty, if you like, uh, they, once they were gone, the situation in Iran deteriorated. It was so bad, so bad, that um, it had implications all over the region. So Israel, at that time, they were struggling with uh, security. They were struggling to find a supplier for weapon. So you can imagine where Israel were at that time when they really needed those weapon, but at the same time, the situation was getting really bad uh, all over the Middle Eastern countries. After a devastating war broke out, Israel still came out the victor, but the next round of hostilities was already brewing. Plus, the conflict revealed a strategic vulnerability on the part of the Israelis, their reliance on foreign military suppliers. If Israel was to survive the next few decades, it had to do something differently. And since it could never match the Arabs in terms of manpower, weaponry and finances, Israel could either innovate or disappear. That imminent danger of total annihilation was a crucial source of inspiration. It sharpened the mind and Israel embarked on a nationwide program to foster new defense industries. Israeli lawmakers tapped into the Jewish tradition for scholarship and transferred those human resources into research and development. A substantial portion of the GDP was devoted to this, more so than any other country. At the same time, a new military unit, known as the Talpiot Project, was created where recruits were tasked 
to observe and innovate. Members one, thing, uh, one thing I want to make mention of the, is that uh, Iran, they spend their GDP, their, their huge portion of GDP to military technology in terms of importing them, um, coming up with new ways of making those weapons. On the other hand, Israel, they do similar things, but their investment really is developing new uh, weapons by investing in the mind and brain of its young generation, especially who are in the military. Now, we obviously know that a lot of the Israelis, they actually work in the military. They are, I think, by law required to work. The point is that Israel, they understood the importance of human resource, and so they invested heavily in it instead of importing weapons or is spending only for the uh, military to boost it to make it more powerful so israel in that case this is why every now and then you see israel is coming up with new innovation new technology of the talpiot had previously demonstrated outstanding academic ability in science and leadership potential they were selected and embedded in each branch of the israeli military from infantry artillery engineering to intelligence and aerospace the Talpiot recruits learned the ins and outs of the military and then joined the research and development program. Similar training programs were later created to attract new talents into the ranks of the military. For instance, a special program was set up that encouraged the employment of veterans into high-tech and engineering companies. So if you were part of a tank crew and you had experience in armored warfare, you would be encouraged to join the development of combat vehicles. While these reforms were being implemented, Israel did something else that was quite unusual. It demolished the bureaucracy, splitting military officials from scientists and entrepreneurs. As a result, the military was able to swiftly and easily communicate its needs to lawmakers, investors, and academics. This close association was then applied within the military hierarchy itself. For example, while most militaries frown upon argumentation between ranking officers, in Israel it became an acceptable practice. Junior soldiers were free to argue with high-ranking officers because it promoted creativity and deflected group thinking. To this day, these reforms remain unique to the state of Israel, and they are nearly impossible to replicate because no other nation lives on the edge of destruction. In the ensuing years, the indigenous Israeli arms industry would prove its ingenuity based on the strategic and tactical circumstances. For example, in 1969, Israel lacked intelligence on Egypt's military deployments in the Suez. So. Israeli researchers developed a toy plane for long flight hours with a camera attached. It was the first military use spy drone, and it provided invaluable intelligence on the Egyptian trenches built along the Suez Canal. The success of that toy plane laid the bedrock of the high end Israeli aerial drones that we know today, and the succeeding aerial drones would play a decisive role in the conflicts with Syria. Meanwhile, at roughly the same time, Israel had been in talks with Britain to acquire a new type of main battle tank. The deal was close to signing, but the British backed away at the last moment. As such, Israel tapped into its human resources of its veterans and designed an indigenous tank of its own. The Merkava, as it became known, rolled out within a few years and quickly became the hallmark of the Israeli defense industry. Another breakthrough happened in the mid-1970s when the Americans provided the Israelis with new methods of satellite surveillance. But the system was not good enough. Okay, so the Americans, they stepped in to help out Israel. Why? Because again, as I said, at that time when Jimmy Carter, he was the president of the United States, he tried to broker a deal with the Iranian regime, with the, the Shah government in Iran. Shah government, when, when they fell, they found, U.S. found, uh, without a leader in Iran that would listen to them. So Khomeini, Ayatollah Khomeini, the Islamic Revolution took place during that time after the Shah collapsed. And so when the Khomeini came, uh, Jimmy Carter found U.S. to be completely lonely uh, without any uh, alliance um, uh, from within the Iranian government, of course. And at the same time, when they looked at Israel, they knew that Israel was also at danger because of uh, this new government, the Khomeini, the Islamic government that came into power in Iran. And so they knew that they need, needed to strike a deal. They needed to come up with some kind of 
um, you know, a protection umbrella for both Israel and also for the United States, uh, and especially for the oil to be able to be pumped out from Iran and be able to uh, go to every corner of the world. Because once Iranian government, the, the Khomeini government came into power, they said we are not going to give the oil. So for many reason, for many reasons, uh, Israel and U.S. they were very very worried with this uh, development in Iran. So they decided to uh, cooperate. Uh, U.S. decided to help out Israel with new technology, new innovation, satellite technology, and whatnot, uh, keeping in mind that Iran was becoming a dangerous country. Lacking in strategic depth. Israel needed real-time satellite imagery, so it kicked off its own satellite program and in 1988 the OFEC-1 satellite was launched into orbit. And just like that, Israel became one of the few nations with independent satellite launching capabilities, quite an achievement for a small nation. However, the underlying factor that accelerated Israel's technological advances was American support. Since 1976, Israel has been the largest annual recipient of U.S. foreign assistance, and in 2001, that aid totaled a staggering $81 billion. Wow, that's if huge. one were to adjust that amount to the annual defense spending of Israel, it would mean that nearly a quarter of Israel's military budget was and is effectively funded by the United States. This aid was crucial for the nurturing of the Israeli arms industry. Israel's reconnaissance satellites would play an instrumental role during the Gulf War in the 1990s. As Iraq fired salvos of Scud missiles into Israel, it shook the military political establishment. Israeli satellites could track hostile missile launchers, but as missiles and rockets became cheaper, smaller and more readily available, the danger came not just from hostile states, but also from non-state actors. So I remember during that time when Iran and Iraq they were fighting, uh, U.S. helped Iraq with uh, with technology, with weapon, not technology necessarily, but weapon. So uh, U.S. they knew that uh, Israel would be eventually in trouble because of Saddam Hussein having those uh, weapons. So uh, you can imagine how important it was for U.S. and Israel to come together. Uh, to join each other's hand and make uh, this uh, uh, relationship work for the safety and security of their countries. Such as Hezbollah and Hamas. At the backdrop of the Gulf War, hostile non-state actors were firing dozens of rockets into Israeli settlements on a daily basis. A new type of air defense was needed to eliminate the threat altogether. So the Israelis pushed for a new defense system and within a few years they delivered three new weapons, the Iron Dome, the Arrow and David's Sling. Each served a different tactical purpose, but together they neutralized the danger coming from missiles and rockets, at least in quantifiable sum. The technological supremacy of Israeli satellites and missile defense systems quickly became a household name. Ironically, even France, Britain and America, who once reluctantly exported arms to Israel, were now fervently importing Israeli systems. Warfare is ever-changing. Whenever a new threat emerges, a new weapon is developed. The latest and current threat to Israel comes in the form of nuclear weapons by Iran. Now, to acquire nuclear weapons, the Iranians have to enrich uranium, which is done by centrifuges. Starting from 2009, Iranian centrifuges started malfunctioning one after another. The culprit was a malicious computer worm called Stuxnet, a new type of cyber weapon built jointly by the United States and Israel. Stuxnet essentially hijacked the Iranian centrifuges, allowing the controller to adjust the speed of the centrifuge motors to breaking point. Without firing a single shot, Israel's new weapon managed to derail Iran's nuclear program. Cyberspace has now become the latest branch in modern warfare, and since the Stuxnet attack, Israel has emerged as a leader in cybersecurity. But the leapfrog in technology that Israel continues to hold has also produced a number of constructive side effects. For one, cutting-edge military technologies have also transformed Israel into a nation of startups. 
It takes time for military advances to transmit into civilian applications, but in Israel, that process is faster because of the lack of bureaucracy we mentioned earlier. So they made uh, for the military very easy to come up with new ideas, new plan, new innovations, and be able to implement those right away. So Israel, this is why you see them uh, becoming such a huge military power so fast. Uh, that happened because the entire country, they used to believe that the survival of the country, uh, the, the nation, the state of Israel, depends on its military, and for that everybody has to play their part. Thank you for watching this video. If you like this video, share this video, and I will see you in the next one. Wonderful day.